Sean Hannity starts now on News Radio Lamb 1180. Let me just tell you, Joe, I've done more in, in 47 months. I've done more than you've done in 47 years, Joe. But you did call the president a, quote, fool, liar, clown, racist, Putin's puppy, that you told him to shut up. Do you regret any of that? No. I didn't. I'm not busting my, my chops to become majority leader to do very little or nothing. We are going to get a whole lot done. And as I've said, everything, everything is on the table. <laughs> Hard to believe, but there's only 29 days left until election day. Yeah, we're coming to your city. Gonna play our guitars and sing you a country song. From coast to coast. From border to border. From sea to shining sea. Sean Hannity is on. I'm right, glad you're with us. 800 941 Sean, if you want to be a part of the program, uh, hang on, putting that out. Okay. So the uh, president has uh, just tweeted out that I will be leaving the Great Walter Reed Medical Center uh, today at 6 30 p.m. feeling really good. Don't be afraid of COVID. Don't let COVID dominate your life. We have developed under the Trump administration some really great drugs. He's talking about therapeutics and knowledge. I feel better than I did 20 years ago. Uh, one, it's not really, I know some have said, but even Dr. Oz in a conversation I had with him said it's, it's not really experimental Regeneron, uh, but again, part of the new family of therapeutics that is, have been now implemented. Uh, which has been driving down those uh, uh, the mortality numbers in terms of people that were to get COVID-19. Uh, uh, Kaylee McEnany, the latest person in the White House, to and, and also Kel Kellyanne Conway, uh, that was late last week, uh, the, the latest to contract COVID-19. It reminds me a little bit of what happened, what we saw in the meatpacking area of, well, there were actually three areas. One was in South Dakota, one was in Iowa. And one was in Washington State, and and then all of a sudden you, they just went in there and they just focused very heavily on containing these these outbreaks or hot spots as we call them. Now it seems like one was at the White House. How? Why? Who, you know, I I don't have the answer to any of that. In 29 days, you are the ultimate jury. In 29 days, you get to decide. In 29 days, this is the tipping point. There's never been an election where more is at stake than this one. Uh, but the president getting out uh, is a great sign and uh, apparently doing well. Um, might have had a rough, from my understanding, based on reports, uh, first initial hours when he was diagnosed and has turned the corner quite dramatically, although there's a little ebb and flow to this. It could be an up and down part of the cycle, but the therapeutics obviously have advanced well enough now uh, that it's helping almost everybody. His includes, I think, a two, the the use of remdesivir and some other therapeutics. Um, I don't know if you ever get the, the full dose. You know, it's amazing, a full story about what somebody's going to use as therapeutics. I would assume for a president or vice president or anybody, um, I'd want to take everything and anything they've got and throw everything they got at it. That would be my, ch my choice of therapeutics, if my doctors would agree with it. Um, we have a zombie poll out. The mob, the media want you to celebrate a pretty dubious poll that came out this weekend that shows Biden with a 14-point lead. As I look into the, the deep bowels of it, I begin to see why it's not one that I particularly trust. Uh, Zogby announcing, Zogby Strategies, EMI Research Solutions, have it a two-point race, Biden 49, Trump 47. His smallest lead yet in a national poll. The survey not only challenged the media's narrative about Biden building his lead over Trump, but it even surprised John Zogby. Zogby said, quote, contrary to my own observations, it looks like the president has not been hurt by his debate performance or nor his hospitalization. 
His 47 uh, percent performance is actually one point higher than his percentage in 2016. Um, now, earlier polls, Biden had a solid lead in two earlier Zogby EMI polls, one in 49-42, another 48-42. Um, the poll that I thought was way out of whack, and I did a deeper dive into it, was the Wall Street Journal poll that had uh, Biden at a 14-point lead. But you're not going to hear a peep about this new poll in the media except this. Um, they used this survey used likely voters. They didn't stack the deck against Republicans the way the Journal did in theirs. It's a partisan breakdown that closely mirrored what we saw in the 2016 voter turnout. That's the Zogby poll. The poll was conducted, by the way, by the Washington Think Tank. We got another poll, the Democracy Institute, on behalf of UK Express. But anyway, the, the monthly Democracy Institute Sunday Express poll uh, shows that the president is still on course for a victory. 46% of the popular support compared with the Democratic rival Joe Biden of 45. That poll completed after news broke that the president and his wife did have COVID-19. 68% said the illness will not impact their vote. 19% said they were more likely to support Trump. Only 13% said less likely. Almost two-thirds said they felt sympathy and concern for the president. And crucially, the president's lead in swing states like Florida, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin remains at 4% uh, by 47-43, and we'll see what happens. Um, now, the Wall Street Journal poll, I didn't quite understand at all because it had Biden at 53, Trump 39. They used registered voters, always a problem, never should be using registered voters. Doesn't make sense. We think we'd learn something. Anyway, it was conducted in the two days following the debate, but before news that the president tested positive for COVID-19. But anyway, as the story notes, it's a poll of registered voters, which is virtually unheard of at this late stage in the campaign because they're so much less reliable than likely voters. Of the 11 polls that made up the current Real Clear Politics average, only two used registered voters. The rest do use likely voters. Uh, then when you look into the, you know, sampling in this particular poll, uh, Democrat pollster Peter Hart grossly oversampled Democratic voters, 45 to 36 Republican. Okay, that's a nine-point advantage for the Democrats. So I'm not sure how, how you get to that number and, and, and have it with any sense of clarity or believability. The Democracy Institute Sunday Express poll reveals that what the election would look like if pollsters did not routinely weight their samples heavily in favor of Democrats. And when you don't weight it at all, it shows that Trump is leading nationally. Now, what does that mean for me? Not a whole lot, to be honest, because there's only one poll that really matters, and that's the one that you actually take part and vote in. Um, and that's the one that's going to matter the longest. I mean, there's anecdotal information, anecdotal evidence. By the way, the president's doctor uh, is now speaking outside of Walter Reed Hospital. Let's just listen in for a minute. Saturations and his work of breathing are all normal. Though he may not entirely be out of the woods yet, the team and I agree that all our evaluations, and most importantly, his clinical status, support the president's safe return home, where he'll be surrounded by world-class medical care 24-7. I'd like to bring Dr. Dooley up to review some more specifics. Good afternoon. Just a brief update this morning. Uh, as Dr. Connolly mentioned, the president uh, continues to do very well. His vital signs this morning uh, were notable for a temperature of 98.1. His blood pressure was 134 over 78. The respiratory rate of 17 respirations per minute. His heart rate was 68 beats per minute and his last oxyhemoglobin saturation was 97% on room air. He currently uh, does not endorse any respiratory complaints, and aside from our uh, evaluation with the multidisciplinary team this morning, uh, has maintained a full schedule uh, ambulating and working on the White House Medical Unit. Well, I'll turn it over to Dr. Garibaldi to again discuss therapeutics. Thanks. 
Hi, good afternoon. And again, I just wanted to echo the sentiment of what an honor it is to, to be part of this, this wonderful team here at Walter Reed. Uh, yesterday evening, the president received his third dose of remdesivir. He tolerated that infusion without difficulty, and his kidney and liver function continued to be normal. Our plan is to give the fourth dose of remdesivir this evening before he goes back to the White House. And we've made arrangements to deliver the fifth and final dose of his treatment course at the White House tomorrow evening. He continues on dexamethasone. And again, the plan for today is to continue to be up and out of bed, eat and drink, and, and work as he is able. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jason Blaylock, who's an infectious disease specialist and the chief of medicine here at Walter Reed, to give some updates on infection control. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, what an honor it's been to be part of this medical team behind me uh, and to care for the president. Since the president's arrival at Walter Reed, uh, he's received medical management that remains in line with national clinical societal guidelines uh, for treatment of COVID-19 infection. In addition, uh, both myself and Dr. Wes Campbell uh, have worked very closely with uh, various uh, laboratories in the area, state-of-the-art facilities to include USAMRIT and RARE on uh, obtaining advanced diagnostic testing to really inform the White House medical team of both the status of the president as well as his ability to transmit virus to others. Also, we have worked very closely with the Walter Reed team uh, to ensure that uh, we are looking very closely at infection control prevention strategies and the right posture so that the president can safely return uh, to his residence. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Conley who uh, will answer any final questions. Thanks, Jason. I mentioned it Saturday, but I'd like to reiterate myself just how grateful the president and I are to the men and women of Walter Reed, our colleagues at Johns Hopkins, as well as the many federal, private institutions that we receive support from. And so long as everything continues on the track that we're, that we're experiencing right now, this time, as the president already tweeted out, is to get him home later today. With that, I'll take a couple questions. Discharge back to the White House when he was given steroids. You've said that he's still on those steroids. Those are medicines, as, as you know, that are usually given to COVID patients who are on ventilators or um, with low oxygen. So, did you over treat him? And if he's still on that medication, how is it safe for him to return to the White House? So we, send, uh, we send patients home with medications all the time. Uh, he, in fact, yesterday afternoon, he probably met most of his uh, discharge requirements uh, safely from the hospital. Uh, and he's returning to a facility, the White House Medical Unit, that's staffed 24-7, top-notch physicians, nurses, PAs, logisticians, and uh, the unit here, uh, the team here behind me is going to continue to support us in that nature. Yes. Dr. Conley, Dr. Conley, what infection control measures are you taking, and how was it safe for him to drive around in a cloth mask yesterday, and how is it safe for him now to return to the White House where there have been so many cases? How is any of this safe? So the... The, the president has been surrounded by medical and security staff for days uh, wearing full PPE. Um, and yesterday, uh, the U.S. Secret Service agents were in that same level of PPE for a very short period of time. Uh, we've worked with our infectious disease experts uh, to make some recommendations for how to keep um, everything safe down at the White House for the president and those around him. Um, we're looking at where he's going to be able to uh, carry out his duties, uh, you know, office space. And, um, and I'll just say that uh, it's in line with everything we've been doing upstairs uh, for, this, for the last several days. Are you, can you tell us, please, on testing? I mean, the mom can't help themselves. They just have to turn this into something. But he's not being safe. He's there. Yeah, no, we're following every known protocol that have been recommended by everybody. Sorry. Um, I'm sure this is a new experience for the doctors. They're just busy saving lives. Uh, do they think the doctors are not going to follow the safety protocols that they probably have all been following from the beginning of this? Unbelievable. Anyway, 29 days, you're the ultimate jury. Look, voting has already started in some states, about to start in other states. For example, you might not know it, but if you live in Ohio, early voting in person begins 28 days before the election. In Arizona, just 27 days. Now, that's why we want you to go to this website created by our friends, Job Creators Network. It's called KeepAmericaAmerica.com. 
They'll get you the up-to-date, most trusted voting information available. And while you're there, uh, we're, they're hoping, I'm hoping, that you can pledge to take another person to the polls. Maybe somebody needs a ride, whatever. Offer to be a good neighbor. Anyway, or help them in any way possible. The 2016 election will be decided, was decided by thousands of votes, not millions. And 300,000 of you across the country are now have already gone to KeepAmericaAmerica.com. We'd love to see that number reach a million and make this the biggest get out the vote uh, effort in conservative history, one that the, even the liberal media couldn't ignore. Anyway, do a little, do a lot, you can do your part, but the first thing you gotta do is go to keepamericaamerica.com now, up to the date information, early voting, register, how to do absentee voting, it's all there, who's running in your district, all the information to help you be a more informed voter. Quick break, right back, we'll continue.